Enols have a functional group that's a combination of an alkene and an alcohol. And that's where they get their name. They're alkenes and alcohols, so they're called enols. The name enolate, with an A-T-E on the end, indicates that there's a negative charge. That's because these guys have lost a proton from the oxygen hydroxyl. And of course, there has to be some counter ion. Sodium is common. Lithium is also common. If you think these structures look strange and maybe not stable, you're right. The enol would much prefer to be a ketone. And the enolates are anions. They're not the kind of compounds you buy. They're the kind of compounds you make in a reaction flask and use right away. Nevertheless, they are truly useful. Let's look at how they're made. Let me first mention that this is generally called the alpha carbon because it's the first one that's next to the carbonyl. And in common nomenclature, the next one over would be beta, and the next one gamma, and so on and so forth. It's this alpha proton that is lost that makes the enol. But under acidic conditions, it starts by protonating the oxygen. In the presence of an acid, a pair of electrons from oxygen is shared. This bond is broken to make the conjugate base. And in a reversible reaction, that proton is transferred to and from oxygen rapidly. There's a second resonance structure. These electrons can swing up onto oxygen to satisfy that positive charge. The conjugate base that's formed when this carbonyl is protonated has an unshared pair of electrons that can be used to remove the hydrogen from that alpha carbon. That pair of electrons swings in there to make a double bond, and there we have the enol. Notice I've been careful to write equilibrium signs for these reversible reactions. Both of these steps are reversible. So enols are formed in acid. In base, we form enolates. Lone pair of electrons is used to, to remove a proton, leaves a pair of electrons on carbon. This is a reversible reaction, which can be used to form a different resonance structure by forming a duct bond between the two carbons, while the pi bond here is broken to put the negative charge on oxygen. And this resonance structure looks more like the enolate really is than the one with the negative charge on carbon. But nevertheless, it's good to write both resonance structures because it's the protonation on carbon that is the reverse of this reaction and goes back to reform the ketone. So this is how enols and enolites commonly are formed. They form in a reaction flask. They react in that flask immediately. We seldom observe them directly. So how acidic is this alpha hydrogen? Well, let's take a look compared to some other compounds that we've talked about as having acidic hydrogens. The proton of water has a pKa of about 16. It's actually 15.7. And this conjugate base is hydroxide. Protons alpha to carbonyl have acidities that have pKa's of the range of roughly 17 to 24. The conjugate base has two resonance forms. This puts the negative charge on oxygen, which is really electronegative. And that's the major reason these alpha hydrogens are especially acidic. Other hydrogens attached to carbon are less acidic. The acetylenic hydrogen is about 25. The conjugate base the acetylide anion, has that negative charge, the pair of electrons, in an sp orbital, which is closer to the nucleus than others, so it's closer to positive charge, which means it accommodates negative charge better. The vinyl hydrogens are about 40, much, much less acidic. Remember, this is a log scale, so this is 10 to the 15th times less acidic. And alkyl hydrogens are about pKa60, essentially no acidity at all. The vinyl anion is sp2 hybridized, and this is sp3 hybridized, furthest from the nucleus. The negative charge is stabilized less by positive charge in the nucleus. So you see these compounds that have an alpha hydrogen really are acidic, far more acidic than the others we've talked about. Let's take a look at this pKa range here of 17 to 24, which after all is large. It's 10 to the 7th. The pKa of aldehyde alpha hydrogens is about 17. For ketones, it's about 19. And for esters, it's typically about 24. So we have about 17. Ketones are about 100 times less acidic. And esters are much, much less acidic than that. Two carbonyls are better than one. Diketones are about pKa 9. When one of the carbonyls is an ester, it's less acidic. Keto esters are about pKa 11. The diester is about 13. 
The special stability of the beta dicarbonyl compounds is easily explained by noticing that there are two resonance structures, not just one, that put the negative charge on oxygen. Extraction of a proton puts the negative charge on carbon in the initial resonance structure that we write. We can picture a resonance form being formed like this. This has a conjugated pi system and the negative charge on oxygen. Two very good things. Or we could write a second resonance structure that puts the negative charge on oxygen by noticing it can go this way. Again, a conjugated pi system, negative charge on oxygen. So it's easy to understand why the beta dicarbonyl compounds are especially acidic. Summarizing the acidities, then, of the alpha hydrogen of carbonyl compounds, the, the diketones are most acidic, pKa is roughly 9, all the way through to esters that have a pKa of 24. If you tend to be a little skeptical, you might be wondering, what's the evidence for the removal of this hydrogen if it goes right back on again? Well, there are some chemical reactions that we'll talk about that point in that direction, but we have some more direct evidence. Let's look at a methyl ketone. Treatment with base and water removes that alpha proton, which is resonance stabilized. The reverse reaction puts a proton back on. We can do this in a deuterium environment. So when the proton goes back on again, it's a deuterium that goes on because this enolate is formed in the presence of D2O, not H2O. So this hydrogen is no longer a proton, it's a deuterium. As this exchange continues, a portion of the time this deuterium is removed, but other times another hydrogen is removed or another hydrogen is removed. So over time, all of the alpha hydrogens are exchanged for deuterium. And the same thing would be true on the other side. If we have alpha hydrogens attached to this carbon, they'll become deuterium. So to take this cluttered drawing and make it simple, in the presence of labeled base and solvent, all of the alpha hydrogens of this carbonyl compound are exchanged. This is true for aldehydes and esters as well. How can we tell this? Well, there are two instrumental techniques that work very well to demonstrate this. First is proton NMR. Because deuterium doesn't show up in proton NMR, we can literally watch the alpha protons go away. The signals for the hydrogens, alpha to carbonyl, literally disappear when they're exchanged for deuterium. Secondly, we can use mass spectrometry. Because deuterium weighs one more than protium, the deuterium-labeled product weighs more than what you started with, and that's easily determined by mass spectrometry. So two techniques let us demonstrate clearly that this proton exchange at the alpha position actually happens. There's an acid-catalyzed enol mechanism that makes this happen as well. Take a look. Protonation of the carbonyl through a reversible process leads to a compound that has two resonance structures. You picture the pi electrons moving up on oxygen, and the conjugate base of that acid removes the proton to make the enol. In the reverse process, the proton comes from the acid is added to the carbon. This makes this carbocation, which has two resonance structures, and as we head backwards, this proton is taken off, leaving the electrons with the positive charge to reform the carbonyl compound. And if this is done with deuterium-labeled acid and deuterium-labeled water as the solvent, we'll add a deuterium to that carbon. So this becomes deuterium, and this becomes deuterium. And over time, as they're exchanged out, sometimes the deuterium is lost in this step to form the enol, and other times it's a proton. So eventually, all of the alpha protons are exchanged for deuterium. And of course, the same thing is true for alpha protons on the other side. And so again, we can summarize by saying carbonyl compounds with alpha protons can be treated with labeled acid and labeled solvent to exchange all the alpha hydrogens. So there you have it. Clear-cut evidence that the enol and enolate equilibrium exchanges happen. And in fact, people make good use of this. This lets us synthesize deuterium-labeled compounds that can be used in metabolism studies and chemical studies to uncover details about the mechanism, what happens to hydrogen atoms along the way, that otherwise we couldn't know.